And I find at this age, quite honestly, there's something that happens in this beautiful bloom of time because you start to realize it really didn't matter that much. I put a lot of seriousness on things that I didn't have to. I didn't have to. Hello, you are listening to the Late Bloomer Living Podcast. I'm Yvonne Marchese, your host, and I'm so happy you're here. I created this podcast to give you inspiration and let you know you're not alone in feeling stuck in midlife. I also invite you to join the Age Agitators Club for Women, where we come together monthly to hatch our plans for making waves as we age. Being part of this community for women will remind you on a regular basis that you're not too old and it's never too late to do that thing you've been thinking about. You can find more information at latebloomerliving.com forward slash community, and I hope to see you there. Hello, my friend. I'm very excited for today's episode because my guest is somebody that I have been, I've had my eye on her for a while now on Instagram. She's somebody who always strikes me as just being real and with this kind and loving nature about her that just oozes out of Instagram and into my life. And it's, it's amazing, really. Her name is Bernadette Pleasant. She's a speaker. She's the founder of the Emotional Institute and the creative force behind the Emotional Tour, which is a transformative mind-body wellness workshop. What Bernadette does is she takes her audience on a physical, emotional, immersive journey that she says encourages them to stop playing small and to instead take up more space with their entire being. She's got certifications in a lot of different movement modalities like the Nia Technique and Ageless Grace pole dance, Reiki, integrated energy therapy, as well as studies in African tribal and free dance. It all has come together in her experience where she's developed her own system for helping people use somatic healing to have breakthroughs in their lives. And here's the thing. What is somatic healing? It might have just been a few years back that I even ever heard the term somatic healing. And I was kind of like, hmm, well, what is, what is that? That sounds very fancy. <laughs> it sounds very fancy. Um, and it sounded very clinical. And honestly, when I started doing research to look up well, what is somatic healing? Okay, so somatic or soma is of the body. I think more and more we're starting to see this connection between our body and our mind. They say the, the body is like the place that stores memories. That if something happens to you, it is literally stored in your body. And... So my best understanding of it is that through movement, you are able to access things that maybe you may not be able to access through, let's say, talk therapy. So Bernadette has her own system for doing this, and I can't wait for you to hear this conversation with her. If you're curious about these kinds of things, come on this journey with me. And uh, without further ado, let's go. Here's Bernadette Pleasant. Hey, Bernadette, thank you so much for being with me today. It is a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Yvonne. Oh, my gosh. I am I am so excited to have you here. I have been watching what you do on Instagram for quite some time. And you, every time one of your videos comes up, I get completely sucked in um, because there's this raw honesty to what you do that comes across to me and, and always gets my attention. Um, so I'm just really, really pleased to have you here today. And I, I want to talk to you about the work that you do around somatic healing 
and what brought you to it? What is somatic healing? I'm getting more and more interested in this idea of this mind body connection and how all of this is, I'm just gesturing with my all hands right now. All Nobody can it. see me, but I'm, I'm on zoom with you and I'm gesturing with my hand. <laughs> uh, you know, all of it is connected. And, uh, and I do find that there are times when I move my body, that there is a connection that happens there that, that can open things up for me in ways that, you know, I meditate and sitting and meditating is, is amazingly powerful for me as well. Not every day, yeah. but it can be, but there's something about movement. And anyway, I just, I just, uh, I'm so curious to hear how you came to the work and, and what you do with it. Oh, I'm so excited to share about this. You know, I, how I came to the work, I, when I think of that, I, I, the question, I always think of, okay, where did it begin? Like, and it, it didn't, it, the work, I didn't, I didn't take a course or, a, or get some certificate or what have you, some particular study. What I did was notice me. Mm. I kept noticing me and what was happening in my body. So somatic healing, so, soma is the body. It's, it's, just, it's simply the body. So the deep healing that is needed in the body the body that never lies and the body that keeps the score and the body that's there through any experience that we have been through. What I noticed was the way my body react, reacted, what I felt in my body. Uh, as a child, when I was aware of certain things and uh, felt fear in my body, how I froze and how it felt so good when I was dancing or playing. Uh, versus these other times when I noticed I would tighten, stiffen, and get still. So there's this, and I, I found myself infinitely curious about that. I preferred, of course, this flowy feeling that was great. And, you know, if, if we think of our bodies as water, I think of uh, being in flow and dance and movement and, and, and versus the freezing and squeezing and the icing that happens when I didn't feel safe. So throughout my life from at various points, I just found it really pinnacle points. What was interesting and what was happening in my body when, when I could use my voice or not use my voice, when I could walk into a room and feel confident in times when that was not available and how my body responded and some years later, I, I know I'm jumping around a bit, but I, I, I'm just trying to get a big overall picture and then I'm sure we'll dive in. But I found myself discussing things that were challenging in my life, talking about them, regurgitating with them, uh, with the therapist with them. And, and the more I talked about it, the less I moved the less I had that feeling of autonomy and, and, and freedom in my body. And mm -hmm. so I started to look for, where is there some place that merged these two things? There's gotta be something that feels therapeutic that actually allows me to bend my knees and make some noise and move around that to release this. And I could not find it and therefore I created it. And so it was my lived experience and my own needs and kind of looking around at other people and thinking, I think they need this too. Yeah. How Whether old were you when you started to figure out that it was something that worked for you or that, that you created this for yourself? And then, I, and then again, when did you figure out it was something you could bring to other people? Ah, oh, I love this question because I was into my 40s. I'd, I'd done some other things. I used to own a bridal salon and do all these other things in the, in the corporate world prior to that. And in my 40s, I, I found myself gravitating towards movement modalities that I thought were incredible, and they were. And so I, I got certified, and then I, and they were great vehicles. I I needed something more and I was trying to find it in something. So a uh, mentor of mine, I was, as I was, I would say, yeah, I was about 48 mm -hmm. when, 
maybe a little you know maybe about 46 when I got this hey I don't think what you're describing you're doing in this brand that already exists doesn't look like that brand I think you're creating your own thing oh absolutely not I don't know how to do that <laughs> meanwhile my classes are filling up I'm already doing it but I'm not claiming it I'm not owning it that I had created something because in my mind I wasn't smart enough to do that I didn't know I didn't have the credentials to do that that's what other people did uh, I and I was already doing it hmm. but I had to come to grips with hey this is working I don't have to hide under someone else's umbrella and try to um, affect their already great work what I had was shaking knees about saying I actually did create something and it is a value and a good and it's working that was a big leap for me Mm, that, that can be a huge leap, can't it? I I recently, you know those those um they used to be everywhere like in in pin, Pinterest and and Instagram, maybe a little dated now, but those those boards where you've got the little letters that you can put on them and okay, so I yeah, yeah, you can put the little plastic letters and put messages up and all that yeah. little message boards. And one of the ones so I got one, it was on sale somewhere, super cheap. And I'm like, I picked one up because I'm a photographer and I thought, oh, I'd be able to use that in something at some point. And what, and I didn't know what I was going to do. And then one day I saw it sitting there and it, and, and I, I realized that the message that I needed to put on there was not for, I wasn't going to use it for photos or anything else. Not, not necessarily. I just took the letters and I put on there, own it own it. And it's, and I, I took it and I put it in my kitchen above the sink where I do dishes all the time. And oh. I see it, I see it first thing in the morning when I go in to get my coffee, I see, it because it is so, it's so hard to own it when so you're doing like on so many levels, right? It's, it's so hard. You're absolutely right. It's hard to own it because at least for me, I was, I was so afraid that by stepping into these shoes and saying, I did this, somehow I thought my believing it might cause it to not work anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, or, or just some limiting beliefs that I just didn't, I, I just didn't have it then. I can imagine for myself, and I don't know if this was true for you, if I were you at that point, I, I would probably say to myself, I can't do this because people are going to look at this and go, who do you think you are? Yes. Was that at play? In Absolutely. Yeah. And nobody could ask, who do you think you are with, with enough more question than I was asking myself. Right. <laughs> and right. you know, you know, I, I really, I love that you shared about the own it and, and because even the power in words, I, I think, okay, I, I'm not a fan of pain, and yet I, I've i never been particularly drawn to tattoos, and I have this tattoo on my wrist, and it says live with an mm -hmm. exclamation point, and live for me, I wanted it on my right hand, the hand I sign with, the hand I tend to use when raising my hand. It is my live in this moment. Take a bigger step, Bernadette. Risk that is going to be even better than you imagine and what however moving forward and taking up more space and owning it looks do that i know what it feels to not do that gotten real comfortable there until i've outgrown it which is what has happened yeah and yeah once you outgrow that it's really hard to fit back into that tight structure yeah yeah wow so I I watched in, in doing a little research um, to have you on, I, I went to your website and I, and I, I found uh, some videos of you as a speaker mm -hmm. and uh, you were speaking at a woman's event and you came on stage and you were just looking hot and fabulous and you danced your way onto that stage and you talked about how that wasn't always something that you were able to do. 
And I'm wondering, um, have you always been comfortable speaking in front of people? No, I have not been comfortable speaking in front of people. In fact, I, I've learned to get used to speaking in front of people. That energy of fear is always there. <laughs> that perfectionist in me that doesn't want to say ums or, you know, have super long pauses or look crazy is always there. And I risk doing it anyway. In fact, not only am I a paid public speaker now that motivates crowds of people and gets them up and moving, but I am coaching other people to find their voice and to do it in such an authentic way. Because that thing that draws us to someone uh, and we watch them, it's because it lives in us. We wouldn't appreciate it if it didn't live in us and it just pulls us a little more forward. Yeah. So I'm grateful that my way of storytelling or sharing with the world is 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 having an impact and, and causing people to lean in. And what I've noticed is that in the world of public speaking, which I think there's a huge opportunity for more people to speak up and get their the stories that are on their hearts and, and their particular brand of wisdom shared in a world. I think there's so much room for this and we get in the way by saying, I'm not good or I, I'm afraid I don't speak well and and we stay there. We stewing in that belief system as opposed to taking a tiny baby step and being celebrated for that. Yeah. And one more and then one more. And who knows, uh, landing on any stage or speaking to any audience in an embodied way, in a, in bringing your body into that speech and really speaking your heart getting the help we need to do that. And that that's what I'm here for. And in, I'm, I try to also be a living example of that. Yeah, I can see that. Um, do you think that the, the physical work that you have done, that the physical healing work that you have done has opened up your voice? Yes, absolutely. The moving the body, again, water, if if it if it's frozen it sounds like it <laughs> if it if it's moving and got some flow there's there's air in through there and it gets to be a dance it actually gets to be a fun experience and not only serving whoever is listening and receiving you but the wisdom of the body tells a story all in of itself before you open your mouth and so learning to stay in connection with this body uh, to do haka dances and sing and move whatever is needed to make you feel comfortable. That is what grounds you. And that dancing onto stage, that was something that, you know, dancing, I feel in my body in that. So if that becomes my signature that I am going to dance on stage. I'm going to get the audience moving because I love the energy of moving people. They listen better. They take in information better. And I'm a grandmother. So I, I believe moving myself and moving others is like hiding the broccoli. I'm getting it in there. I don't need to make a big announcement that moving your body <laughs> will allow the information to come in. What I want people to do is be in flow and movement and that's why i use live drums with those things because that drumming bypasses all this crazy it helps to get into the body yeah wow yeah and people sound different when they're literally coming from an embodied place i i find you know people who come to me for to learn to get better at speaking i'm like you, you, that mannequin with a microphone no we're not doing that we're literally about to put some music on and do some somatic practices that get you in your body because that way you notice the way your pitch changes. It, it absolutely does. Yeah. You're doing, you're doing grief work, mm -hmm. correct? You're yes. um, doing work around race and healing. Can, can you speak to some of that work that you're doing? 
Absolutely. Grief work is so important. Talk about water in the body. Um, and if it gets it, when it gets stuck because it gets stuck because we don't know how to grieve. It it the there this work has come to me and is so important to move through move grief through as opposed to trying to get over it to be patient with it and take care of our bodies during this truly intimate and beautiful time it doesn't feel good but it is it's a, it's a it's a rite of passage it's ceremonial when when people are grieving they don't know how to do it and therefore there becomes an impatience and a fear of it and while no one wants to experience grief because we live we will grieve yeah. And the work I do with that is like in some cases private and others group, but helping people and I'm developing an online program right now that literally will help people move through grief by acknowledging its existence. And so that is the work. It is just very dear to me because it's so needed in the world. And as for race work, that is, that, I feel like as a black woman, I I always do some, just by, you know, waking up in the morning, I do some kind of race work. 400 Years was a program that I put together shortly after George Floyd's murder. That, there were so many uh, white body friends who were reaching out to me saying, I need to do something. What can I do? What can, where can I learn? And I could hear the genuineness in their voice. And I could also hear so much fear. And I know <laughs> yes. when you're afraid. Speaking of the white, you know, the white, the white girl is raising her hand right uh, now. <laughs> absolutely. And, and yeah. And I, and so, you know, I, I could hear that. Mm -hmm. And at the time, while I knew plenty of anti-racism programs and what have you, I didn't know of one that included the body enough. So if you can imagine, and it's not hard to imagine, you know, we think back to that time shortly after or right as everybody got to see this gruesomeness and, and there was a terror in the body for anyone that saw it, just terror in the body mm -hmm. and we want to do something we really want and there were people whose whose nervous systems were overridden by this tragedy happening literally right before their eyes and it, it brought in this awareness of holy shit i can't this is not okay it's never been okay but this was seeing it and, but in that state of shock, in that state of what can I do, you literally can't help. You, you can mean well, but you know, you're traumatized and trauma can really, in a, in a traumatized state, no one can be of any good use to anyone. They're trying to survive. Hmm. So, that wasn't a time for how can I help? It was a time for how can I learn? Mm -hmm. And what I wanted to do in that moment was talk about racism and create experiences where it was good for learning. In my opinion, no one learns when they're being shamed. There's that is now you're in another uh, trauma response. And so what was important to me was to create a, a very real, very honest, but also compassionate program that included the body that is freaked the fuck out. Mm -hmm. I need to do something, you know, to create this, this, let's move, let's do some somatic experiences, let's hum together. I know this is big, we can do this, we're together, let's breathe. Let's breathe, let's do, and now let's continue a little bit, and now let's pause, let's breathe. 
Move your body. Get up. This is a lot. I know. It's been a lot. 400 years of it. Let's breathe. You can do this. And that's what 400 was about. It was a beautiful program. And my why for 400 years was I have three grandsons. I have three incredible grandsons and I want a world that is different for them. And that's only going to come by my stepping forward and saying, Hey, I will, I will throw my hat in the ring and try here. I can tell you one of the things, and I will say this about 400 is some schools reached out and wanted to have the program and, and, there was a lot of interest. It filled up right away. And the second time I offered it, not a single person. Because it's what, sadly, it, the crisis. And then we get uncomfortable and go back in. Crisis. And we, you know, it's like this rubber band effect. And so um, I can't say that I was surprised, but I was disappointed. And so mm -hmm. I look forward to being able to bring that back uh, when, when there's enough of a desire and need for it. Yeah. The work I do is about speaking up and taking up space in your body and your voice and your presence and truly owning it and, and living in every moment because I desire for something to change and that's not going to, it's not going to happen magically. Yeah, certainly isn't. You know, my, the podcast is, is really about our experience as we as we age yeah. and our impression like the the stories that we tell ourselves that are so ingrained the older we get so how do you what would be the first thing that you would suggest to somebody who has some healing to do and is looking at healing through the body as, as that channel to, to get there, what would be some place for somebody to start researching or otherwise? Yeah, I, my first thought and, and is to rest. When we get a thought about doing something um, I find our Americanized ways is to Google it and go find it and go search after it. Now go get it. Now sign into it. Or, And then we're not considering that personally we need to be with that awareness for a minute. How does it feel in your body? What is it that your body it wants to do? What's an edge? What, how about we don't go for an edge? We go for a next step. I, I what do you mean people, by what's an edge or we don't go What's an, ever, an edge? Sometimes people shoot into things because uh, they haven't had enough time to sit with what's true to them. Mm -hmm. So you, so it's you, like you, pushing yourself to the edge of something? Exactly. And um, when we are in need of healing, edges is not a really good place to be. Mm. We're, we're needing to like oh, be with it, be... And and then is it because you don't feel safe on the edge? Is there a certain amount of safety that it's you because need? Because we just want to get fixed. <laughs> it's because yeah. we want to hit a button. I if I sign up for this or if I take that or if I do this, it's going to. Can I just be better now? Yes. Can I just push that be easy button? Now? <laughs> yes. And because of that, I think we get so little growth because there's so there's so much quickness to fix. People want, you know, I, I, I want to take your, your two hour program, but I want the results of the six month coaching program, or I want to, I want to do a full day with you, um, as opposed to the four day private retreat in Kauai, where we can really dive in deep. They want it now. They want it quick. Mm -hmm. Um, no doubt. I mean, some people will have a hard time sitting through this podcast time. We, we just want get to it. I, you know, fast forwarding through life. And, and I think it's in that way that we get surface level healing and band-aids don't really, they're, they're treat, treating 
um, the symptom, not the cause. Mm -hmm. So it, it causes it. We need to widen, lengthen, go deeper, slow down, sit with it for a minute because the next step will become really clear. And, and then I, I think working with a coach, I love working with people who are just, just needing to come along, not be dragged or pulled and what have you, but space be made for them to move through to what's next for them. Yeah. Midwife of sorts. Midwife. I like, I that. love midwife and people's, ideas and dreams and, and, and movement. And, you know, so often people just say, I just don't feel comfortable in my body or I don't know what embodiment means, or I'm all in my head really good about this, but slowing down, that's hard. Getting yeah. quiet, that's difficult. And that's where we work. What, what have you seen happen in your own life that is, that has been a result of the, of what you've done, this mm. process that you've lived through? I found that I can be honest. Honest with myself, honest with others. I have found that challenges are worse because I've, I've, I haven't, there was something I was pretending not to know or somewhere I didn't feel like I could have a voice around something. This work reminds me of the wisdom of my body. It, I, I, I'm, lear I'm learning and integrating tools at the same time that will support me to raise my hand, to have a conversation, to state my desires, to take the risk of launching something or writing something. And to not take myself so seriously that that I, that I'm harsh on myself and bullying myself because it wasn't perfect. Mm. That's what this work really gets. It it it, it compassionately goes deeper and al allows someone to bloom forth with with joy and with with some humor. I mean, because you know, it's it's really it's we we suffer in the stories we tell ourselves in the way we don't show, show up. I've done that. And I, I, this work allows me to grieve the parts of me that are scared and to bring them along and to not try to be a perfectionist, but know that learning in real time is some of the best learning ever. Mm, and it, and isn't it a, though yeah. it is it oh, is oh yeah and there's something i about have a, a coach who 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 likes to say you can't steer a parked car i, I love that you know <laughs> it just instantly brought that to mind for me i'm hearing in in what you're saying that it's and and correct me if i'm wrong or reading into it more more than what you've said but i'm hearing that it's allowed you to um find to, to tap into like a courage but hold it in a light way yes yes not wear the courage as a breastplate uh -huh. but certainly just just be courage as opposed to wear or put on courage and sometimes yeah. we have to put it on until we get to just be that and then we get to a point where we're thinking wow the old me would have made a big deal out of doing this thing and i just did it i yeah. just did it I, you know, I, I had an idea, it, it could be anything. And I just decided to pick up the phone and do that or write this letter or go live and talk about this, this thing that's on my mind. Just not take myself so seriously that I am sucking the living juice out of life. I love it. What do you wish your younger self had known? That I could do it and that I was smart enough. And yeah. that the very fact that I that that an idea came to me meant I could in fact do it. And that figuring it out did not have to look like perfection. Mm, I love yeah. that. Yeah. Speaking as a recovering perfectionist. <laughs> Same here. <laughs> <laughs> I love that it helps you to tap into honesty. Um, 
I I have always been a bit of a people pleaser. And mm. so, and that comes from really a dishonest place, doesn't it? The, it, it, it doesn't allow for an honest relationship with the person who you're trying to please because it's like you're anticipating what you think they want. And there's like, how do you really connect with somebody if you're if you're doing that? Absolutely, it, it, you can't show up authentically, and 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 a, a, an idea, a thought just along that because I too that people pleasing. Oh gosh, it's it's been, it's gotten me into such a state of financial debt, emotional debt, just just frustrating, and and it, it's complicated because a lot of it is happening in our head and we are we're we're convinced that the story we've created is it mm -hmm. but i think of where did it start you know people pleasing at some point and this is what comes in the rest just this knowing at some point that people pleasing came because it was safe to please somebody mm -hmm. and then and that got locked in because, you know, that reptilian uh, mind gets the, this is safe. And so if I don't say anything, or if I don't speak up, or if I don't, you know, do this thing, or if I give them this, then they don't see this and what have you, whatever it was, it was making it safe, but it was hiding us from our truth. And we got used to doing that. And now to be authentic and speak up and to say, Hey, I don't, I don't agree with this, or I'd rather try another way or, or no, <laughs> whatever it is that we can do it and other people will be okay. And if they're not, it's their work to do, not ours to do for them, which is what we're doing when we're people please. Yeah. That's a lot. It's a lot to take it's care of us and others. It's a lot of juggling. <laughs> it's a lot. It's it is a lot. It's too much. And at what cost, <laughs> and, you know, but it's hard to even know sometimes when you're so um, entrenched yeah. in doing it. It's kind of even hard to know sometimes that you're doing it, you know, until I got, I'll find, um, you know, I'll say yes to something. And then I feel resentful about, you know, the time comes to do the thing. And I'm like, ah, yeah, I don't. and then I'm like, oh, OK, because I said yes when I didn't want to say yes. Right. Yeah. And that's slowing down really notice your body i tell people this all the time please even when your phone rings and you look at who's calling notice the body mm. response mm -hmm. notice how you feel when you have to um walk into a room notice what your body is doing it is giving you information galore and the more we override that you know, don't answer the phone. Do you have, do you really have to, or can you answer the phone with some limitations? Hey, listen, I've got five minutes. I really have to, you know, I only have five minutes for this call or two minutes or, you know, or not answering it. Whatever it is, notice your energy. What brings you, what brings you more breath, more movement, more flow? And where do you feel that frozenness? Pay attention. It's all there. The mind will tell you you have to do things and then you regret it. The body was telling you all along. Mm. Yeah. Truth. Yes. Truth. <laughs> <laughs> that body says yes. And we're sitting there trying to be cute. Like, no, no, I, maybe, <laughs> you know, go for it. Go for it. What would you, what, what would you, what, if a toddler wanted to do something, they just do it. And, and they deal with the consequences in real time and move on. Okay, that, ouch, that hurt, they cry. Or or that, I didn't like the way that was, they will let you know. So and are somewhere you saying that way, we should all just kind of go back to being toddlers? Cause well, I'm all in. <laughs> I'm, I, listen, I like this whole toddler thing, but what I, that it's always there, that grown up version of us that has, and has learned a little and also has, has got the grown up version is like the 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 lion tamer with the chair and the whip, right? And right. He's like, exactly. <laughs> get back in there, or, or no, no, no fun for you today. It's like the you know the soup Nazi. It's like telling you what you can do and can't do, and all this kind of stuff. And wait a minute, 
it might be fun. It might be different. I know we've never done this. I'm scared too. Let's try it. Mm. Yeah, it's okay to take some risks. And I find at this age, quite honestly, there's something that happens in this beautiful bloom of time because you start to realize it really didn't matter that much. I put a lot of seriousness on things that I didn't have to. I didn't have to. And 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 I say do more of that because really... Why not? I'm on a total mission right now, Bernadette. I'm actually in the middle of a challenge for, I, I don't know when your, your episode is going to air, but we're talking in February. It's February 22nd. I am on day 22 of my living playfully at any age challenge. Yeah. And the whole idea of it is, first of all, to give myself more time to play that is not guilt ridden with, mm. oh, this is a waste of time, or this is self-indulgent, or, and, and the other thing is to step into the tasks that are in front of me with a more playful, experimental, holding it lightly kind of attitude, because as you said, you make it harder than it needs to be, or you make it, you know, more serious than it needs to be, and so I'm in the I'm I'm in a deep dive right now. And the funny thing about being in a challenge like this, Bernadette, can I just tell you? <laughs> it's crazy because it makes you hyper aware of every moment. It's making me hyper aware of every moment that I'm not playful. Yes. And then and then there's this tendency in me to go to be, like beat myself up. Well, you're not being very playful now, are you? And it's like, okay, no, no, no. Let it go. Let it go. Let it's it not go. Sing a song about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think about what did you love to do? What whatever it is as a child, what did you love to do? Because this first of all, this challenge sounds amazing. And I love the energy and the way you refer to that fun, you know, stage is am I having fun? I think about what did I love to do as a kid? Whatever it is, you know, for somebody with whatever some fun thing was going down a slide on being on the swings for me it was jumping double dutch and how much i enjoyed that how much finding the timing and jumping in and and making dance of doing this thing and hearing the cheering around and it was all fun so how can i bring that level of play I'm not going to whip out a double dutch necessarily, though I think that's not a bad idea. Every I once am back while. on my roller skates after. Oh, I love years, it because yes. that was it for me. I was like, yes. the, you know, so and I'm loving it. It's so right. fun, right? But you may but, not, you may not be able to. You may not be able to do the thing. Absolutely that you, right. But if you meditate on how you felt and taking out the the this this isn't a time to oh I can't do it anymore. It is a time to. Think back to the feeling of when you did it. How did your body feel? And is there any way that just thinking about it or using that thing as a metaphor for where you are now and what's possible? Like, how does it help to pull you forward into like a, a euphoric state of joy about anything you approach? Yeah. Find some That's like aspect of it that you something. can actually to get into like what yes. part of that thing that you loved can you still tap into like right. can can you find it doing a variation of the thing right right and the, a variation or the, is there music that is you feel is inspired by that maybe you are listening to that music you could be listening to the music and in your kitchen cooking versus you know being on the slide or playing hopscotch the point is i am using that energy that my body knows that experience i am meditating on that and i am bringing that vivaciousness into whatever i'm doing yes i can't hear michael jackson's i want to rock i want to rock with you, with you. All, night. all night i i am instantly transported to yes. the roller skating rink when i was you know yes. what I mean? 
<laughs> and like you can, like that can be it. Like get yourself like a, a song list that is all yes. about the things that tap you into those moments, right? <laughs> Just as you said that, I thought about being at, I was a terrible roller skater, but I loved the atmosphere of being at the rinks. And I think of the songs, Bounce, Skate, Rock, Roll. I love this song so much. Bounce. <laughs> Uh, skate. Mm. And I just loved it. And I was a mess and I was falling down and I get back up and I keep going because it felt good. So now at 59, I am not getting on the skates and on the rink and risking falling down. But you know what? I can listen to that song Absolutely. and I can dance around my house and I can take care of some chores while just being in that energy. And that's what I would love to encourage. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Oh my gosh. It's been so fun to talk to you. How can people find you and follow you and, uh, and take next steps with you if they want to? And what are you excited about that's coming up? Anything? Uh, yeah, I'm excited that I am waking up. Literally, we took a break um, on, on my website right now. It says we're resting, but we are slowly waking up and we're doing it in such a beautiful, compassionate way for our, ourselves. So as I'm waking up. People can follow me at theemotionalinstitute.com. That's our website. And we have some new offerings coming up. And I am, we are at TEI Emotion on Instagram and Bernadette Pleasant on, on IG. It would just be great to be in touch with uh, your listeners. And what's coming up, what's coming through right now is, is a writing workshop that I'm almost finished creating on grief. And it is it is literally embracing this grief thing so that we can help to move through it. Mm. Uh, after my mom passed, I started doing some writing and I've always been moved to speak and dance and create workshops. And now I'm picking up the pen and I'm moving it and, and it doesn't have to be a fairy tale. It really gets to be my honest truth because that's how we heal by being witness. So I'm looking forward to that and some somatic work around moving through grief. I have been um, following your um, your path mm -hmm. uh, after your mom's passing. My father also just passed away. And I've been you know, with you as you're reading some of the poems that you've written or some of the writings that, that you've done. And, and it's really amazing. So people go listen. Yeah. I will have uh, links in show notes for you. If you're driving your car right now, <laughs> don't worry. I got you covered. Um, I'll have everything in the show notes so you can connect with Bernadette. And thank you so much for your time today. I totally appreciate it. Thank you, Yvonne. And I just want to say I, I I feel you in the loss of parent and just sending you weighted blankets of hugs and just one breath at a time. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. you. Back to Thank you. Thank you for sharing your audience with me. Thank you. Oh, so happy to have you here. Well, there you have it. You know, one of the things that I think really struck me is that she had trained in certain movement modalities and had been teaching for a while before really owning the fact that she had created something new and distinct, something that was working for her students. And it took her some time to own the fact that she had done that. And I think there's a lesson for that in all, for all of us. And I think there's a lesson for all of us in that because we all have life experience that we just brush away because it's our life experience. You know, we might we might not have certifications or awards or things that say, you know, we're bona fide. We may not have a psychology degree or we may not be a lawyer or we may not be whatever it is that's in our minds that we think we need to be in order to offer something out in the world to make a difference for other people. We tell ourselves a story and we limit ourselves. I'm speaking for myself here. <laughs> I do this. I do this. I'm raising my hand. So th this is what 
really struck me in my conversation with her is that here she was doing it the whole time before she decided to claim it and step into it in her own right. So something to think about. That's all I'm saying. If you would like more information about how to get in touch with Bernadette, you can head on over to latebloomerliving.com forward slash podcast and look for episode 179 and I will have everything for you there. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for being here today. Hey, I did want to mention to you that we do have another gathering of the Age Agitators Club coming up on Wednesday, April 3rd. That happens at 4 o'clock Eastern time. It goes for about an hour on Zoom. So you can join from anywhere. Come as you are. And if you want to try out the community for a month for free, just get in touch with me. There's so many ways to get in touch with me. You can email me at latebloomerliving at gmail.com. You can also go for more information on the website. You can go to latebloomerliving.com forward slash community and find more information and a place to sign up there and try the free month. Super easy, easy peasy. Come and do it. Check it out. See if this is a good match for you. I would love to have you there. I think you'll have fun. Um, Yeah, that's it for now. In the meantime, I'll be back next week. Stay safe and well. Talk soon.